Well, hello, friends. Uh, this is the Cultivate Podcast, uh, Ministry of Mercy View here in Tulsa. And if this voice sounds a little different this week, it is because the roles have been reversed. I am here with my friend and executive director of Mercy View, Trey Hopkins. What's up? And uh, the reason why the roles are invert, inverted this week is because... Trey preached this week, and so I'm going to ask him questions like he does for me most weeks, because uh, I want to hear from him. So uh, let's jump in and All talk right. about uh, this past week. We concluded our series. Got to wrap it up. And uh, we looked at the piece of our liturgy that relates to communion, or as some people call it, the Lord's Supper, or even the Eucharist. So... Um, Thanks for doing that for us, yeah. Trey. It was great. Um, share with us a little bit, just um, kind of what were your big points this this week? What were you trying to communicate to us? Yeah. Uh, man, I was excited to get to talk about this. I think I mentioned that in our very first episode, that like this was the sermon I had slotted on the schedule, and I was excited about it, uh, just because I think in the last five and a half years being at Mercy View, one of the things that I've loved the most is that we we practice this each week. Um, and the thing that I missed the most during the pandemic when we either weren't meeting together or when just because of all of the strictures around trying to watch out for germs, we didn't we didn't actually have the Lord's Supper for I mean it was it was an yeah, extended period of time. Sure. It might yeah, have it, it might have been almost a year. Yeah. It was yeah. a it was a long time. And I just remembered being really sad about that. And yeah. so I did a lot of thinking about it. Yeah, man. Right? And and processing through um, why that seems so significant. Um, yeah, so this week, uh, was super excited to dive into that. Uh, got to unpack 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26, which is a passage that we read every week almost, because when we come to the table, the liturgist is often reciting that passage. Um, and then I tied that in with Revelation 19, 6 through 9, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, and so, yeah, the, the big idea was really just looking at what it means to partake the word. Now, that's what we were calling this sermon. And I think the the ideas that I thought really undergirded that the best were the ideas of remembering, which kind of comes from that First Corinthian passage, and uh, rehearsing, which comes from the Revelation passage. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, really in a lot of ways this week was a little bit of a play on words. In the previous weeks... We would say things like, hey, we want to talk about singing the word or, yeah. or reading the word or preaching the word. This week, really, it's the big W word when we talk about partaking right. the word. And so let's just talk a little bit yeah. about what that means for us at Mercy View, because right. depending on maybe the tradition you've grown up in or just what you're familiar with, the tradition you're in now. Right. Um, there actually is somewhat of a, a spectrum of thinking sure. about what's actually happening in the time of communion as we partake the big W word, and so which is Jesus, is right. what, 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 which is why right. we're saying it's a little bit of a play on words. What would you, or how would you say Mercy View yeah. uh, would, would think about that? Yeah, I, actually, I had a section of my notes that I, I pulled out just beforehand because it wasn't super necessary for kind of moving the sermon forward. But uh, just kind of talking about the different ways that folks approach the table, uh, I kind of followed after a, a statement that I think I left in my notes, but that was basically, hey, we've talked about how the Word centers all these other parts of our liturgy, um, but it's when we come to the table that it, you know, if I said, if I may, um, takes on flesh and blood. And then there was this whole section where I was going to like dive into yeah. just for a minute and talk about the fact that like I say that, but I don't actually mean it in the sense that maybe uh, the, the Catholic Church would mean it, right? Where the idea of transubstantiation that like once it's blessed, they believe that the wine and the bread actually become the physical body and blood of Jesus. Right. Right. And right. so that's, uh, and another thing, I didn't realize this, maybe, or I'm sure I knew this, but I didn't think about it really intently until I was studying this past week. But like in that moment too, and this is why the reformers were so against the mass, 
they were saying that because this is the body and blood of Jesus, literally, it is a perpetual sacrifice that is being made. Like his body and blood is actually being sacrificed again. So it kind of flies in the face of, yeah. you know, the once and for all yeah. that we read in scripture. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's the Lutheran view, which is adjacent to, but not quite that. They don't believe that it once blessed is the actual body and blood of Christ, but that there's some kind of metaphysical yeah. supernatural thing that happens called concepts, consubstantiation yeah say that where, five times right, fast yeah. <laughs> transubstantiation and consubstantiation <laughs> uh, wh- where in consubstantiation metaphorically the body and blood of Jesus yeah. his physical body and blood yeah. coexist with the bread and wine that yeah. still maintain themselves as bread and wine right right and, and they still are actually that those, um, so those are kind of on one side right. of the ledger so to speak on the other side of the ledger is really very similar to what my understanding of communion was growing up, right. what we practiced, which would be a mere memorial, yeah. just a time of remembrance. We would not say that that is how we practice right. communion. No, that's, and, and, you know, that's the maybe even a distortion of but the what's called the Zwinglian view, yeah. right? Because uh, this guy in the midst of the Reformation, his last name was Zwingli. Cannot remember his first name to save my life, but sure. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> sure. <laughs> but he uh, had like just kind of articulated the fact that hey, what's taking place here is a remembering. It's a memorial of what's taking place, uh, what took place on the cross in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But there are traditions like the one I grew up in, man, for sure. It was very much a this is something that we do to remember and and it became a mere memorial and i i would say that it became that largely because of something i actually talked about in the sermon which was we didn't practice it very often like at most we would practice it once a month right we we wouldn't do it more than that and you know i, I kind of brought this out quoted uh theologian peter lightheart talking about the fact that There's this sense that you get in those kind of traditions that the reason we do it sparingly is because we want it to keep its significance. And and I just like the more I've thought about that, the the more I've been at Mercy View and experienced doing communion week in and week out. I'm like, how does it have more significance if I don't do this? Yeah, because I'm losing out on this opportunity to actually participate in and partake in this means of grace that God has for us, which I think that's at mercy of just the way that we would talk about it. Like it, it is for remembering it's a memorial, but there is no an, less than that. Yeah. yeah. But there is an active and, and present work of God's grace toward his people in that. Amen. Uh, yeah. and, and had to make the distinction, right? Like this isn't like saving grace. Absolutely. Right. I, I, I quoted, uh, theologian, uh, Richard Barcelois, who, uh, talked about means of grace as like the delivery systems that God's instituted to bring his grace to us. Like, yeah, so, and by that he means like spiritual power, spiritual change, help, fortitude, and blessing. Uh, and, and, and that God's using various means for that. We talk about that all the time. Right. And, and the Lord's table is one of those, right. Coming yeah. to the supper is, yeah. is one of those ways. Um, and it's Barcelona says through, the Lord's Supper, Christ is present by his divine nature mm-hmm. uh, through which the Holy Spirit nourishes the souls of believers with the benefits wrought for us in Christ, human nature, which is now glorified and in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And, yeah. you know, this, like, idea that the, the eminence of God yeah. through the Holy Spirit because of the work of Jesus uh, there's something special that takes place when we yeah. come to the table. Yeah, and, and that is absolutely what, uh, you know, for me in my growth and in, in sanctification and trying to understand, and, and in particular thinking about how are we going to practice this at Mercy View, um, this particular, you know, position or view that you just described um, became so compelling to me because there is a true spiritual communion 
that's taking place right. between the Lord and his church as we sell it. So that's why it's more than just a time to remember. There is a, a a almost, an I would say, an anticipation, an expectation, and this is what we're trying to help our people understand. Like, as you come to the table, um, there is a true sharing in Christ that yeah. takes place in the moment, right? Yeah. Means of grace. There is a mean of a mean of grace like that is that is coming to the believer meant to uh encourage them and shape them i mean the reform yeah. view the it's a largely reform view is the idea of that the, that jesus's real spiritual presence yeah. is evident in the lord's supper so you know I, yeah it's, it I, creates it's huge. i mean we call it communion for a reason right it's like meant to create this u- deeper sense of union with christ and with one another Right, like so, so failing to participate in it, it neglects really an avenue for both of those things to happen and to deepen. Uh, I quoted from from Lightheart. Uh, he said that biblically worship without a meal isn't really worship because worship in Scripture always takes place around a table. And so then he he said, if we have Lord's Day worship without the supper, uh, he said it's like we're the disciples on the road to Emmaus, yeah, I who that was cool. who decide not to stick around for Jesus to break the bread. So we never actually see Jesus. Like he, and he goes through this list of things. He's like, it's a contract without signatures. It's right. a wedding feast without actually having a meal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so there, there's this relational component to it as well. Which goes back to, or at least touches on another practice of ours. You, you already referenced it, but the idea that um, this is something that we want to do every yeah. week um, you mentioned on Sunday that one of the critiques that you hear of that is is what why like why you shouldn't do it weekly because yeah it, it makes it less important right it yeah. makes it less significant it's just uh, and your your response this weekend was uh, what did I say exactly it, I don't know <laughs> yeah it, you you basically said it doesn't make a whole lot of sense yeah, to me that, how that would make how, it. how it would make it less right. significant one of the things that I and I agree with that one of the things that that I would um say to someone that that says that too would be um well, then I guess we should sing less often then. Right. You know, maybe we should preach less often. We do those things every week. They don't lose their significance because they do that. Right. It really is, I think, uh, a it's tradition speaking or, or um, a kind of felt experience uh, speaking versus like, what if what, what, what we say at Mercy View is true, what we just said about it is yeah. true, this is a place for us weekly to engage with, connect with the Lord. We call it the high point right. of our service uh, because of that very thing. And so uh, to me, these kinds of things, it's just always about the heart. Yeah. You know, I think the thing I said was that it, when we, when we only do this once a month, we're removing this weekly opportunity to be reminded of God's grace of our sin and the price that was paid for those two to meet. Right, yeah. that, that that's what's taking place at the table. And so, you know, walking through 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, we, we looked at this remembering component. Um, but then I, I wanted to make a big point to kind of shift gears and look, not just the fact that we remember, because I think that's where a lot of times it gets left, yeah. right? But we also got to recognize that when we come to the table, because Christ is risen— mm-hmm. We are not just remembering what I mean. What is a actually? I mean, the death of Christ is a sad event, right? It's the it's the saddest day in all of history. Yeah. But the resurrection happened. Yeah. And because the resurrection happened, one day we're going to be glorified as Christ is now. Yeah. And so, what we're remembering is the path to eternal life that we have in Christ. And so, we should actually come to the table with a sense of joy and celebration. Yeah. Um, I said celebrating what is being done and what is being undone, Yeah, right? That there's this already not yet that's taking place uh, in the life of the believer, in yeah. the life of the church, and in, in the world, right? Yeah. That, that communion is actually uh, an eschatological meal. Yeah. It is a meal that is about the last things, and yeah. it points us 
to those things. Yeah. I want to get there here in just a moment. Okay, okay. But, uh, because that was a big part of your, your sermon, talking uh, from uh, Revelation 18 and 19. And I think that was a really cool point. But but uh, what I thought of this weekend as you were talking about that, first of all, it's an important thing to say because not, the, the re- only remembering thing does have a tendency for uh, us to like stay in the somber mode. Right. right. That, that's what you're saying. But... Um, I love the fact that you said actually there should be real joy in coming to the table because really, you know, if as we've repented and believed anew and received God's grace anew, and as we approach the table and receive those means of grace, there should be there really should be a freedom, a joy, a happiness that my sins are forgiven. Like that's really good. And I thought of something that John Piper once said on a different topic. Um, I, I think I was at a desiring. God conference once, and someone asked him why he doesn't use humor or something in his sermons. And the 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 short of it, he he was just like, um, I think Christian worship should be all about serious joy. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I mean, that's very Piper esque, right? Um, uh, <laughs> and and I think he probably also was speaking to just the overall worship thing, kind of like, and. and it's funny because I, I experienced that really in the whole like conference, everything. There was a real seriousness to it, um, and and yet joy in the mix of it. And I think that's maybe another way we could say yeah. it. We approach the table with serious joy yeah. because our sins have been forgiven. Yeah, it, right. They, I mean, made a really big point to say that, hey— when we come to the table, like we're not coming to it flippantly, yeah, right. We we come to it with joy because we're examining our hearts before we come to the table, and we're leaving our sins at the foot of the cross, yeah, right? Like right. we're coming with joy because we've left our sins, and we're coming to this picture and reminder of what's happened to our sins. That's right, they've been swallowed up. Right? right, they're they're gone. Yeah, and you know, I, I my favorite. Uh, assurance of pardon verse to to use when I'm uh, doing liturgy is from Psalm 103, mm-hmm. right? That like God does not stay mm-hmm. angry with His people forever, yeah. Right? That our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Well, one of the things that um, I thought might be interesting to talk about would just be some other ways that we practice communion, not not other ways, I guess, but just um, some other uh, components or, or kind of some of the, the things that surround communion um, that are a little different maybe than, than other places. And one of those things is we do something, and you didn't use this phrase this week, and we don't really use this phrase a ton, except the liturgists do this. We fence the table. Right. Let's talk a little bit about what that sounds like on a yeah. Sunday um, as folks are listening to this podcast so that they can maybe begin to make a connection there and, and yeah, really understand sure. the why of that. Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's typically at Mercy View. Uh, you're you're going to hear whoever's doing the liturgy say, hey, this is a family meal, yeah. right? This is this is for the people of God, yeah. um, and it's, it's meant to be taken by the people of God. Yeah. So if, if that's not your story, right— we would want you to refrain from coming to the table and actually come find someone to talk with and, and, and have questions answered or pray through the hope of the gospel and, yeah. and come to faith in Jesus. Right. Like this is like right now, this isn't for you. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, you know, th- there's a point that I, I tried to make on Sunday, right. That, and, and I talked about actually like in my intro, to the whole sermon, right? That like there's a missional component to what's taking place in communion, right? I, I quoted, that's actually the first time I quoted Peter Lightheart mm-hmm. was up at the top because, and, and I think this is like really helpful for us to think about in light of the entire series we just did, right? right? He said, the church fulfills Jesus's mission by being what she is, a liturgical city. Mission starts with liturgy. Liturgy is the time and place where the church gathers as the city council, the ecclesia of God, an assembly of the heavenly city. As the real men and women and children with real bodies and souls gather for worship and disperse from worship, heavenly life comes to earth. And then he had this statement right here, which I think is really like something that jives a lot with 
things that we say when we come to the table, which is having tasted the good things of the age to come. The church goes out to share those goods in the marketplace. And what, what the phrase that we say right before we invite people to the table, it, or how we invite mm-hmm. them, right, is come, yeah. taste, and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. And that's the invitation. Yeah. Right? That's that, hey, believer, right? If, if you're a believer, mm-hmm. if you need to be reminded this week yeah. that God is good, come taste and see. You actually get to, with your own taste buds, yeah. Right with your own hands, that you get to come and taste and see that God is good and that He's being good yeah. to you. Um, yeah. It, it, as far as like why we fence the table, this guy kind of got off track on that because we were talking about that at first and just got you're excited good. about the missional piece. No, 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 uh, no, no. <laughs> no, I, no. You're not off track. That's, <laughs> right. That's actually that matters. Uh, I think a a part of 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 what's ha- yeah. happening there in that. You actually just used another word that I hadn't thought of yet, and it's it's also one of the interesting things. We get asked from time to time, like, why don't we do an invitation? Right. And you know what the answer really should be? We do. Right. It's when we fence the table. Right. The invitation, Absolutely. that is our invitation for those who don't yet believe to place their faith and trust right. in Jesus. There's this thing that's getting ready to happen, this you know, ordinance that, that right. they can't participate in, but that's not meant to be restrictive in that, right. like, hey, we want to keep you from the family of God. We're actually saying, hey, we want you to be a part of this, but there is something that needs to happen first. Well, and there's this other sense in which when we're fencing the table, we're doing something else that actually is directed at believers too, right? So, like... The fencing of the table is to like coordinate off like from those who, because they aren't in relation with Christ, would be coming to the table in an unworthy manner. That's right. Paul is not talking to unbelievers when he says that, though. He's talking to believers. That's right. And he's saying, hey, the way that you're acting and living your life right now, you need to check it. Yeah. And you need to ask yourself, am I approaching the table in a way that's going to honor the Lord? Or am I approaching in a way it's not? And so he he dives into, yeah. hey, what's going on right yeah. now here in Corinth? Yeah. All of these issues that you guys are facing, where you got folks who are poor, don't have anything to bring to this love feast, and they're coming and they're going hungry. Mm. And then you fools who got some money yeah. and you got the food, yeah. you're showing up and you're getting drunk and you're becoming a glutton. And he's just calling them on the mat and he's like, hey, this is for the people of God together and so examine your heart examine yourself right verse and, 28 yeah, yeah. First and, and so the reason for that i mean he even connects that to people being sick and dying i know right i mean like we don't think about things in those terms a lot of times like we forget that you know acts chapter 5 happened like lying to the holy spirit can get you drug out right by your toes and, you know we, we forget that like god really does care about this stuff and yeah. so I, I made a point when I'm talking about, hey, we're going to celebrate when we come to the Lord's table. Yeah. This is why we don't come flippantly, yeah. right? Because this matters to yeah. God. Amen. All right, so we got to talk about this on, <laughs> on Sunday. We had an epic moment towards the end of your sermon. As you were starting to land the plane, you were um, moving us into the book of, of Revelations, which, uh, which we were trying to figure out, you know, that you were helping us figure out the connection right between the Lord's Supper and you know what's happening there yeah. and so so let's talk about that but let's I want to also mention the <laughs> the moment that happened kind of as you transition from Revelation 18 to 19 right because it was awesome so so <laughs> first though like on a more serious note what were you trying to yeah, connect um, the the Lord's Supper to in, in in the last book of the Bible yeah so in Revelation 19 you, you get this picture of like the the battle between Christ and his enemies is done. It's completely said and done. He's won and there's this giant victory parade happening. And so you get this what John describes as a multitude uh, of the redeemed, right, of the saints, a voice, the what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And it's in this, like, just sound of joyous triumph that we get the announcement that the marriage of the Lamb has come, 
And the angel says to John, write this down, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And so, you know, when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, he says, hey, you're going to do this. I want you to do this until I come. I'm not going to taste of the fruit of the vine again until I taste it with you in my kingdom, Mm. right? And so, like, you have this, like, picture of, oh, we're at that moment yeah, right here. Like, this is happening Christ is being united to his bride. And so I'm explaining just kind of the context of that. Uh, And I'm like, Revelation 18, Christ just vanquishes all of his enemies. Chapter 19, this victory parade starts. And I get to that point, I go, hey, Christ and his bride are united. And all of a sudden, I just hear like a pop. Yeah. (laughs) And there was a microphone like in a stand behind me. And it was sitting perfectly fine in that stand. And then at that moment, it just like hit the ground. And I was like, all right, and just pause for a minute, <laughs> and then uh, I just said, "Hey, the Holy Spirit just did a little mic drop over here, dude." <laughs> like, it was so great. It was so great. It, it, I was actually thinking about in a, in the preaching lab how how often we say to these young guys that we're training, like, "Hey, there's going to be some moments when you're <laughs> preaching where something weird might happen, or or you might lose your place, or you know, there's these things that we don't really want to." necessarily make a thing out of because right. it, it was distracting enough. And so um, you can't teach what you did on <laughs> Sunday. It was so, so good uh, and, like, just so perfect for, it, oh, for the Oh, it timed moment. up perfectly. Yeah. I mean, like, you're talking about, like, the triumph of Christ at the end of the age and a microphone just, like, falls out, like, literally like a mic drop. Like, come on. Like, literally that, that a was mic fantastic. drop, yeah. That's well, not the only time I've ever been interrupted during preaching. You remember that guy, time the homeless guy came in and starts shouting me down? For, yeah. like, he's just, like, say, I mean, he was agreeing with me. That's true. But, yeah. like, <laughs> I have forgot about that. That was one of those I didn't acknowledge. Sure. I just kept going. Sure, yeah. But that was pretty funny. Sometimes that's appropriate <laughs> uh, to not acknowledge. Let's let's do this. Let's just talk about where you kind of yeah. closed the, the sermon on Sunday. You brought us to Hebrews. Yeah. Um, and uh, so tell us a little bit about what you were doing there. Yeah, so uh, two weeks ago, you were preaching on preaching the Word, and I was doing liturgy that Sunday, and we just kind of think, okay, how do I tie the sermon into the message that Brad just preached? Um, and I was just reminded of that weird little verse. I mean, it is a weird verse in Hebrews 12, verse 24, where the author says that the blood of Christ speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Yeah. Um, and so I just kind of unpacked that. We did communion, like had that there. And then as I was thinking about how to close out the sermon on Sunday, I just, I was like, you know, that is such a great picture of what's happening in communion that like there's a sermon being preached by the body and blood of Christ but also, man, what a great way to finish out this series that we've been in, where we've been talking about how the Word of God shapes our liturgy, and Christ in Scripture is is described as the Word, right? He's the Word of God, and so His blood speaks a better word because He is He is the Word, yeah. and so you know, just unpack the fact that what what Hebrews is referring to is Abel was murdered, and when God confronts Cain, He says, "Hey, listen, man." I know you're lying to me because your brother's blood is crying out from the ground, right? It's this allusion to you've shed your brother's blood and now there is a demand of justice that's on you. Mm. And kind of crazy. We even see God give grace to Cain in that moment, right? right. But the author of Hebrews picks up on this, right? And and he talks about in Hebrews chapter 11, verse four, how the righteousness of Abel, was found in the faith that he had to believe that if he offered the sacrifice to God, it would be accepted. And and just, it alludes to the fact that, like, the reason that Cain killed Abel is the same reason that all these people in the Hall of Faith that we look at experience the things they experience, especially the ones toward the end of that, right, where they're fed to lions and sawn in two and, like, all of these things that, like, are talked about having happened, right? It's because, like that there's this righteousness that comes through faith and that's all mediated by the blood of Christ. And he's making this point when he gets to chapter 12 that, Hey, listen, if Abel's blood was able to cry out for justice because he was counted righteous because of his faith, how much more does the blood of Jesus cry out 
for justice. And what the crazy and the really cool thing is and what communion reminds us of is that the blood of Jesus cries out for justice, but it also cries out and says the wrath of God is satisfied. Yeah. I took that justice on right. my shoulders. Yeah. 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 It's like you think about the fact that like on the cross, Jesus prays that those who are killing him, yeah. that who are actually taking his life mm. would be forgiven because they don't really know what they're doing. He, he says that prayer and then his blood at the foot of the cross that's been shed speaks and proclaims and preaches forgiveness is found right here. Yeah. That's so good, man. Yeah. I think I told you on Sunday, interestingly enough, I I had the privilege of preaching uh, at a church here in Tulsa um, that uh, been connected with that pastor for many years, church plant. Uh, They're about five years old. And I preached from Genesis chapter four on the issue of worship. Right. And uh, it was just so cool to hear you um, referencing that story and talking about me. I just thought, what are the... What are the odds? I mean, we don't really right. believe in odds, right? So, like, it was just very like, wow, the providence of God. It's really, it was just cool to see. Well, hey, let's do this. Yep. Um, before we close up shop, we've been at this a while uh, today. I want to talk about the series that we're headed yeah. towards, um, beginning this Sunday. So, so for the next five weeks, um, we are beginning our final. This is crazy to say, our final sermon series at. Uh, Memorial Baptist right. before we yeah. moved to Wilson. And we called an audible um, last week. Uh, we were going to do something different, but what we've decided to do is uh, a five-week series um, really on the idea of missional living. The The name of the, the series is going to be Go and Tell Missional Living in Everyday Life. And we're this is what our thinking was. This is a great opportunity to sort of remind our hearts about what it looks like to be salt and light in that particular part of our city as we return there. You know, mission is one of our three values as a church. So to be missional is just sort of like the adjective version of that, which means um, what does it look like for us to live out that mission in the places that we live, work, and play? And I guess you could really say worship really as well, because this is not necessarily a permanent location for us, but it is the place that the Lord is moving us to. So if you're a part of Mercy View, uh, whether you're a member or a partner with us or in our orbit, you're going to want to make sure and make plans to be here and join us yeah. for that. Um, as we say, if you are if you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you come hang out with us and hear about part of our heartbeat as a church. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, exciting uh, to just think about the fact that we're doing that series because we're going back to Wilson, going to get back to worshiping on Sunday mornings. I, I know I, for one, am, am yeah. pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, hey, thank you for listening to the Cultivate podcast this week. Uh, we produce this primarily for those folks who are a part of Mercy View or hanging out with us. If you're not, uh, we thank you for listening and hope that you found this edifying and encouraging. And until next time. <laughs>